Let's continue worshiping this this morning. Steve up, he's going to give us some announcements. Yes, I feel like, oh, I'm, okay. Uh, we are glad you're here this morning. We had about 90 of our Cornerstone people last night over in Waterloo for the big night, big church night out concert, and so that was great. Is anybody here part of that group? Yeah, that's, that's good. We had uh, several blurry-eyed people that had been out way too long last night. Okay, anyway, we're grateful that you're here. Gonna uh, talk a little bit. Oh, I uh, inherited these announcements. Um, first of all, uh, we wanna just say that Jingle Jam is on for Wednesday night. And we would love our entire church family to be a part of that. You can sign up uh, RSVP at the Next Steps information booth right outside these doors. You can call the church office. Uh, that helps us know how to plan for the food. Uh, one of the things, that, uh, great news is we've got all the desserts we need. So all you diabetics, tough luck. <laughs> uh, I just want to ask you to think ahead on the Christmas Eve service. Uh, in the morning, we're going to have our, our uh, normal morning service, but it won't be normal. It'll be all about the birth of Christ. And on that evening at 6 o'clock, bring somebody with you to both services because it'll be a really special time. You realize that there are a whole lot of people they never 
think much about church or Jesus or God. But around Christmas time, somehow the gate slides open a little bit. We want to take it, I hate to use the term, we want to take advantage of that. I don't want to manipulate anybody, but I do want to invite people to be a part of that experience. So our uh, Christmas Eve evening service starts at 6 o'clock. And so please be inviting people for that. Uh, last thing is that on Christmas Eve in our morning service, on the 24th and on the 31st uh, New Year's Eve service, we will not be uh, having our kids connect. We will have our first look, which is the nursery and the toddlers, but uh, the older kids will be in with us. So I want to invite the guys to step forward. We're going to receive our offering now. Uh, Scott said this in first service, and uh, I thought it was such a great concept. This, this time of year is a really unique time of year. Does it seem to you that people's generosity kind of goes up a notch? I, I love that. I, I, I kind of wish we, that could happen all year long, but I would have more socks and underwear that I knew what to do with if all my family's <laughs> generosity got that way all year long. But I think this is a great time in our service because it's, this is not just a piece of a Sunday morning service. This is an act of worship that we get to engage in. And uh, we get to express our generosity and gratitude to God for all he's done for us. And we have a number of ways you can do that. One it has to do with electronics. If, if you uh, text CCC people to 77977 on your phone, it'll help you set you up to make a contribution. And uh, that's, that's a possibility for you. Of course, we are glad to have your cash and check in the offering as well. But most of all, we want to thank God for his generosity to us and then reflect that back in our worship. Let's pray. Lord, we are so grateful that you sent Jesus as the greatest gift of all, that your generosity meant that you would send Jesus from the perfection of heaven to us. And now, Lord, as we respond to your generosity by giving back to you a part of what is already yours, we pray for your blessing on us and on this offering. In Jesus' name, amen. Nothing compares. 
God, our hearts sing your name this morning. We run into your arms. We, love and we run into your love. We love you so much, God. Be here this morning. Allow us to feel your presence. As Steve stands up to speak, allow us to hear the words you have, Steve, to say. We're so grateful for this time, for this season, and for the reason of the season. In your precious name, I pray. Amen. You can have a seat. I'm off to the exchange. Don't lock up a moment early. No, sir. Yeah. You'll want all day tomorrow, I suppose. If it's quite convenient, sir. It's not convenient. And it's not fair. If I were to hold back half a crown from your pay for it, you'd think yourself ill-used, I'll be bound. But you don't think me ill-used when I pay a day's wages for no work. Christmas comes but once a year, sir. Poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December. But I suppose you must have it. Be here all the earlier the next morning, Cratchit. Yes, sir, I shall. I certainly shall. Make sure. Yes, sir. And a Merry Christmas to you, Mr. Scrooge. Humbug! Ah. I bet you know about that. Um, whether you know about it as an employee <laughs> or whether you just know it from the story. Uh, it was back a century and a half ago, or more, in 1843, that a reasonably, but only mildly, successful novelist uh, was finding a, a real difficult time in his life because he, he, there was enough uh, income to almost make the ends meet at the middle. But on this particular uh, fall, there wasn't enough. And so just because he didn't know what else to do, he took a, an aimless walk uh, down the Thames River in London. And the, mindlessly, just walking, he uh, took a turn onto a street he'd never been on before in London. And it was a, a, a difficult, kind of dangerous even, neighborhood. It was where the poor lived. Those that were just one step away from the poorhouse. Those that were just one step away from all their creditors. And in that moment, he realized what his next story would be about. He determined that it would be a story of hope. And he would use the most hopeless of main characters to tell this story of hope. Of course, you know that was Ebenezer Scrooge. Everybody knows that, for crying out loud. Even Donald Duck did a movie of the Christmas story, right? Uh, well, it became one of the best-selling of his books. And he went on with uh, a dozen more highly successful novels. A truly... Uh, a, a true first edition of this book that was uh, printed uh, back there in December of 1843 is today worth from $18,000 to $45,000. The first printing was only a few thousand books, and they sold out by the Christmas Eve of that year. And then there followed many other printings of the book. Well, uh, of that first printing... Uh, Lewis, uh, uh, Charles Dickens had, I don't know how many, but several that were his to inscribe and to give to people, his friends. Uh, if you can come up with one of those, they call them the Carol. If it's inscribed as a first edition by Carol to a friend, guess what it's worth today? between $50,000 and $280,000. Wowzer, I'd love to find one of those in my attic. You know, that kind of turned Antiques Roadshow on its head. Well, there you have the backstory of a Christmas story, a Christmas carol. Every story has a backstory, and the Christmas story from the Bible has a backstory, and that's what I want to talk about. See, the Christmas story didn't start with a, a teenage pregnant mom and a, a young carpenter husband wondering how in the world they got pregnant when they had never been intimate with each other. 
It started 2,000 years ahead of that with an old couple wondering how in the world they were going to get pregnant. It starts with Abram. Somewhere back around 1926 B.C., about 2,000 years before Jesus, God visited Abram in Ur of Chaldea. And you'll find what God said to him in Genesis chapter 12. We're going to read that from verses 1 through 3. The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. In other words, he was saying, Leave all your security. Now, to us, that's not a big deal. I came here from Las Vegas, 1,000 and who knows how many more miles, almost 2,000, and a world away. Well, it was a big deal, but it wasn't that big a deal. But when God called Abram to leave the security of his home, that was a big deal because he lived in a world that was not very safe, that where decisions were executed by the use of power and force and violence. So the bigger and the stronger your clan was, the bigger and more well-established your city was, the bigger and better your security. Well, God essentially was saying, leave all the security, leave all your family behind. What I want you to do is take what you can carry and go away from here. Oh, and by the way, I'll let you know where you're going when you get there. I mean, he didn't even leave him with a garment. And then in verse 2, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great. Right. Well, he was 75 years old, and they didn't have any children, he and Sarai. Uh, you don't have to be a gerontologist to realize 75 years old is kind of past the childbearing window, right? So this was a little bit of an impossible promise. <laughs> way out of the realm of possibility. And yet, it's what God said. And then he said, and I will be, or you will be a blessing. Well, we can race right past that and not realize that in, in Abram's day, it wasn't about blessing anybody else. It was protecting yourself against other people groups. It was about establishing your security and your boundaries. And often that was done by conquering and annihilating and wiping out the nations around you, enslaving them maybe, but it was never done by blessing. It was way out of the norm by a long shot. I will bless those who bless you and curse uh, whoever curses you, I will curse. And then here's the unbelievable part of God's promise and calling to Abram. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Again, God, I don't have a child. And if it's going to be blessed by me, I need a son. Nations plundered and exterminated and enslaved other nations back then. In fact, a nation then was nothing, pretty much nothing what we think of when we think of nation. Nation then was a city-state. It was a collection of tribes. It was a small relatively small group of people and they didn't bless other people they took other people out and all the peoples on earth really from a Bedouin with his possessions in transit to a destination he didn't even yet know eventually God settled Abram and his family in what we today call Israel and God changed his name from Abram which means high father to Abraham which means father of multitudes, father of many. But still even with a name change, no son. Eventually though when Abraham was 100 years old and Sarah was not that much behind him in age, they did have a son. The first son they had was when Sarah took it upon herself to answer God's promise and by her means, by giving Abraham her servant to have a child with. And they did. His name was Ishmael. But after that, God fulfilled his promise and gave Abraham and Sarah a child, Isaac. If you feel like your family is messed up, and a lot of times 
around this time of year, it's like somebody turns the heat up on the messed up in families, right? Everything gets exaggerated this time of year. I know that in my own life, I bet you do too. If you think your family is messed up, you need to go back to Genesis and read from Genesis 12 to the end of the book. This is one incredibly dysfunctional family. I think they put the fun in dysfunctional. Uh, Abraham was not the most honest of men, although it's very interesting. God, in the New Testament, Abraham is said to have been God's friend and was obviously blessed by God. Well, Isaac had uh, two sons, Jacob and Esau. There was this big conflict. Esau should have gotten the family blessing and inheritance, but he sold it for a bowl of soup. Esau means red, but it should mean duh, because that was a stupid thing to do. Jacob got the blessing, and it was through his lineage that Abraham's family continued. Jacob had 12 sons by four wives. Pause. 12 sons by four wives. That wouldn't set up any dysfunction, would it? Ooh. If they had had a family crest, it would probably have looked like this, and the motto would have been jealousy and rivalry. But there was no room for the real motto, which is dishonesty, because that's what the family was founded on. Joseph, the, the next to the youngest uh, son of uh, Isaac, for kind of legitimate reasons, was despised by his 10 older brothers. And to the degree that their first thought was, let's kill him until daddy died, right? And then a light bulb over their heads. We can't kill him. Let's sell him and make a profit. So they did. There were Bedouin slave traders that came through. They sold him into slavery. He winds up in Egypt. A long, uh, interesting story of his life in Egypt you need to read this for yourself. Genesis is an incredible book of narratives and true stories. Well, uh, Joseph winds up being a, the, the reason why Egypt survived seven years of drought. Seven years of drought. California is going through quite a drought. Uh, I don't think it's been seven years yet. And it, a seven year drought is devastating. Well, long story. A good story. I wish you'd read it for yourself story. Uh, Jacob sends for his family who were back in Israel and brings them lock, stock, and barrel to Egypt. And the Pharaoh gives them the best land in Egypt, the land of Goshen. Well, that was all great. And Israel and uh, Joseph's family prospered while they were there, as long as Joseph was alive. But after Joseph died, the pharaohs misremembered his influence. They forgot him, and what is what the Genesis record tells us. And Israel become, becomes a slave nation for 400 years, slaves in Egypt. Now, at this point, the promise that God had made to Israel seems incredibly and absolutely impossible. How will they bless all the nations in the world when they're held hostage in Egypt? And not just held hostage, but slaves. Then God sends Moses. This was in about 1446 B.C. And Moses carries them out of Egypt. This is called the Exodus. And it, the Exodus began with the culmination of ten plagues. The last plague was the death of the firstborn. By the time Israel uh, and the Exodus began, Pharaoh was not thinking Israel was a blessing to him. He'd lost virtually everything. And so through a series of miracles that I wish you'd read for yourself in uh, the, the book of Exodus, the beginning of the book of Exodus, Israel leaves Egypt and plunders the Egyptians in a most interesting way. They asked their neighbors for all kinds of good stuff, like jewelry and gold and silver and bronze, and their neighbors gave it to them. And they left Egypt as a very wealthy nation, but they left 
Egypt, and because of their unbelief, they wander in the wilderness for 40 years. Moses dies, and Joshua takes up the leadership. And they do cross over into the promised land, and eventually they subdue it more or less and begin to uh, inhabit it as their own. They didn't they didn't uh, push out all of the pagan nations, but they pushed out enough that they could survive. And that ushers in the age of the judges. Now the judges, when you read the book of Judges, it is a narrative after narrative after narrative, and it follows a pattern. Israel believes and trusts God, and they prosper. And then they get so comfortable with their prosperity that they quit trusting God, and God releases adversity for them and they have to be rescued out of that by a judge. They turn back to God and trust him and then over time they quit trusting him and guess what happens? Adversity comes. They need another judge. And it's just this encyclic thing. The last verse in the book of Judges sums up the mentality of the, the whole nation of Israel at that period of time. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. King James Version says, each man did, was right, did what was right in his own eyes. In other words, they just did what they wanted to do. That's kind of social chaos. Certainly, uh, it's not the best way for a country to survive and exist. Well, uh, shortly after that, the last judge is Samuel. Samuel leads Israel well, although he's a lousy dad, but he, he leads Israel well. They come to him and say, we want a king just like all the rest of the nations around us. Samuel, that breaks his heart, but God says, no, we're going to do this. So they designate Saul as the first king of Israel. Saul starts really well. Uh, the scripture says he stood head and shoulders above all the other men. I mean, he was a, a man among boys in some regards, but his heart was not right. And toward the end of his reign, he did some really stupid, boneheaded things. He dies on the battlefield, wounded, and then takes his own life. And when he dies, then David is brought forward as the king of Israel. It's a long story, much longer than I want to take to tell it. Did I mention I wish you'd read that for yourself? It's in there. Sometimes we are so attached to the New Testament, we forget the Old Testament. And I think, okay, you get my drift. Um, David becomes king. And under David's reign, because David is an incredible military genius and a man who has put his full faith and trust in God, although he did some stupid things too, that's kind of a theme. <laughs> People, God uses people who do some stupid things. I find hope in that. Uh, and you should too. Well, David expands the borders of Israel and it becomes a, a dominant country, a dominant nation on the world scene because of his leadership. Uh, as he was at the end of his life, he designates his son Solomon to be king. Well, uh, there's a whole bunch of intrigue involved in that. And you, again, read it for yourself. But Solomon was said to have been the wisest man on the face of the earth. Wow. The people traveled many miles. Other leaders of nations in the world traveled many miles to set his, at his feet and to gather his wisdom. He wrote thousands of, of uh, songs and thousands of... Uh, uh, Proverbs. He wrote, he, he identified plants and animals. and I mean, this guy was brilliant. And at first, he led brilliantly because he was following God's design. One of the big things God had told Solomon was, do not marry outside of Israelite women. Take your wife from Israel. Well, Solomon didn't pay attention. He thought it was better to be politically expedient his first wife was the daughter of the Pharaoh. That broke with God's design, and it was the first of many of Solomon's wives. And they were not Israelites. Not only did he take wives from pagan nations, but as he took these wives, he took their gods as well. And so he began to worship idols. 
gods that were no god at all. Well, when he died, after Ecclesiastes is a great book, especially if you're like 55 or older, it, you will resonate with Ecclesiastes. When you're in your 30s, it's just never mind. But when you get older, it's a huge, incredible book. And it's about, it, it chronicles Solomon's effort to understand life. And, but at the end of his life, instead of him giving Israel as, a, as a, a strong, wealthy nation that it was at the time of his death, to a son who could rule, well, it's a long story, but the kingdom divides because his son made some huge, stupid mistakes. And the kingdom divides. You have Israel in the north and Judah in the south. Israel is a bigger landmass, probably uh, about the same amount of people as Judah in the south because Jerusalem was in the south, and that was the largest city in the whole uh, nation. Well, 300 years of a divided kingdom ensue, a divided economy, a divided religious uh, observance, uh, a divided philosophy, a divided army, a divided leadership. Division was the theme for 300 years. Assyria invades Israel in the north and carries the, all, the leading citizens off. And they leave behind the poorest of the poor to do whatever they wanted to in the rest of the land. Eventually, Assyria is taken over by Babylon. Babylon then comes back to Israel and begins uh, a siege to take Israel, or Judah, excuse me, Judah, to uh, Babylon. It was a really depressing time to live in Jerusalem because you had this army who, listen, Babylonians were not fun people to be taken captive by. They were awful and brutal. And with, with Babylon building siege ramps on the walls of Jerusalem at the doorstep, knocking on the door, God opens up Isaiah, one of his prophets. And Isaiah speaks the word of God. Listen to what he says. Bear in mind, what's the status? What's the situation in Judah? They are, I mean, they are weeks, weeks away from being taken captive. Isaiah in 49.6, it, it is too small a thing, he writes as speaking for God, for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Not long after Isaiah spoke these words, Judah fell and 70 years of chaos and then uh, captivity ensued where the leading citizens of Israel the majority of Judah and Israel were now in Babylon, and they became part of Babylonian culture. There's a terrific story about that in the book of Ruth. It's an interesting book. And um, the, one of the things of interest in that book, just a little uh, bunny trail here, is that the name God is never in the book of Ruth. Never. It's worth, it's worth looking at for yourself. They finish the 70 years, and Sira sends the, them back. He sends back a group, a s relatively small group, back to repopulate Israel, to rebuild Jerusalem. That was Nehemiah, right, who did that, and to rebuild the temple. Well, they did, but the temple was so... It was less in every way. It was smaller in square footage. It was less in its magnitude and glory than the original temple had been, the one that Solomon had built. In fact, uh, the scriptures say that the, the cries of joy and the weeping of sorrow mingled because those who were old enough to have remembered the original temple were so disappointed by the lack of glory and majesty in the second temple. Well, Israel began to 
reestablish itself, but not in any means the way it had been before. The last prophet to speak was my favorite Italian prophet, Malachi, Malachi. And uh, in the first chapter uh, that we have recorded by, of, of his words, he wrote, he spoke on behalf of God. My name will be great among the nations from where the sun rises to where it sets. In every place, incense and pure offering will be brought to me because my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord Almighty. Great among the nations? You know, if the promise that God had given Abraham and then reiterated through Isaiah had seemed impossible, this promise sounds ridiculous. Israel had been reduced to a shadow of itself. It had come to become a second-tier, second-rate, non-dominating power. It wasn't even a world power. It just was another regional entity, just a tiny nation that was barely even a nation. Couldn't hardly take care of itself. For the next 400 years, there was no word from God. This is, uh, Bible scholars call this the 400 years of silence. Toward the end of that 400 years, at around 63 B.C., Pompey comes from Rome and he captures Israel. And he doesn't do it kindly. He uh, does it as a Roman. And uh, although they were perhaps less barbaric than the Babylonians, they were not very diplomatic. And partly as a result of this, Israel isolated themselves and insulated themselves against any non-Jewish peoples. They became just ensconced Jews against the rest of the world. They truly had no interest in shedding light for the Gentiles. The Gentiles were their enemy. And you know what? The Romans... The Romans thought they were pathetic. Th this is one of the sayings. Nobody is interested in a God who can't take care of his people. And that's what they thought about Jehovah, the God of Israel. Things were hopeless for Israel. Things were as impossible and as hopeless as they had ever been. It seems like that's when God does his most impressive work is in those moments of hopelessness. Fast forward about 65 years from the birth of Jesus to the writings of the Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. But when the set time had fully come, the old King James Version of the Bible says, in the fullness of time, think about what that meant. First of all, it meant this was no accident that Jesus came when he came. Jesus came at a time God had designated, God had chosen for this. And why would he choose this time? Well, think about the ancient world. The Romans made things possible that had not been possible before. That I don't know, you probably have heard of the Pax Romana, meaning the peace of Rome. The world was generally at peace. Now, granted, peace was enforced by force, but it was at, at peace. Um, there was a, a very strong representative form of government in Rome. There, the, they had constructed roads that are still in use today. The, the phrase was, all roads lead to Rome, and they did, because Rome was the center of the known world at that time. Now, one of the things that made possible is that before these roads had been constructed, you could send a letter from one side of the world, the known world, to the other side of the world, and it would take years for it to arrive at, at its destination. But with this organized system of roads, a letter could go from one end of the, the world to the other end in mere months <laughs> instead of years. What did that mean for the spread of the gospel? When Paul and Silas and Barnabas and uh, Philip and the other apostles slash missionaries headed out, they had great roads to take their journeys on that led to important cities all over the world and eventually to Rome itself. 
the, the Romans had created a system of ports so that shipping and commerce could take place. In so many ways, it was the right time. Paul goes on, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. When no one expected it, when there seemed to be no hope, God breathed hope into the world in the most unconventional and unexpected of ways. Of the four Gospels, only Matthew and Luke give a narrative of Jesus' birth. Mark and John don't cover it at all. They start with Jesus as a probably a 30-year-old man. Well, Luke and Matthew give us the story of of the coming of Jesus. But let's be honest, there's not as much detail in the way they describe the story as I'd like. It's still a little bit sketchy. Wouldn't you think when the king of the cosmos came down to earth, there'd be a few more details about it? But there weren't. We don't even know the exact day of his birth. We celebrate it on December 25th, but really, uh, if you know anything about sheep herding, and I basically only know secondhand information about it, the middle of winter is not the right time to be out on the hills with the sheep. That would be the spring or the fall or the summer. Uh, so the date, December 25th, is kind of, well, if you know the history of how Christmas, our celebration of Christmas came about, you know, it was actually appropriated by the church to give people a reason to celebrate. And think about this. Uh, the, the shortest day of the year is, does anybody know when that is? The 21st, that's called the winter solstice. It's the darkest, the day when the world is darkest for the longest. And so it is more than ironic that December 25th, we celebrate the coming of the light of the world. Well, even though we don't know what the day was, we know that he came. And we know how he came. I am not nearly as concerned as knowing when, about knowing when he came as I am about that he came. To me, that's the point. I believe Matthew and Luke got it right. At just the right time, at the time God had decided on and designated, when the world was ripe for it, Jesus humbled himself and left the perfection of heaven to come to a messy and messed up earth. He came as a helpless little baby. All babies come helpless. But there was something unique about this helpless little baby born in a barn. He came in the most unusual of ways. In fact, he came as no other baby ever has or ever will come in all of human history. Let's look at Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 26, where God speaks out to Mary. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin. Pause. Virgin means what you think it means. She was a young woman who had not had any kind of sexual relations with anybody. But she was pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. That's a pretty amazing statement. To have found favor with God, I wonder why. In my opinion, there's only one reason anybody finds favor with God, and that's because of their faith. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary had, found, had incredible faith. And because of that, she had found favor with God. But I wonder, even with that incredible faith, how would she have been able to deal with this word from God that she would conceive and bear a son? That in itself, to a teenage Jewish girl, 
would have been breathtaking because if a girl got, married, uh, got pregnant out of wedlock, they didn't send them to an unwed mother's home. They took them outside the city and they stoned them to death. This was, from one perspective, a death sentence. And yet her faith believed there was more to it. But can you imagine when, when Jesus, uh, God got to the end of this, that this would be his own son and his kingdom would never end. I wonder, even with Mary's incredible faith, it might have been hard to imagine that. The most inconceivable of events, the fruition of God's promise from 2,000 years ago reiterated 700 years before and then 400 years before was coming to pass. Nobody could imagine the way it would come to pass through a humble teenage girl from a town in Israel that had nothing to really recommend it for greatness. In the end, God kept his promise to Abraham. He did exactly what he said he would do. All the peoples of the earth are blessed through Abraham because of Jesus. As it turns out, God made good on his impossible, improbable, irrational promise. Who but God could bring this whole thing to come to pass? I mean, it's, it's a complicated story. It, it involves many different characters, and it spans thousands of years. Who but God could bring that to pass? I mean, some people think that makes it less likely. I think it makes it more likely. You can't make this stuff up. So the Christmas story really began 2,000 years before Jesus was born. And now it continues 2,000 years later through us. Bah, humbug. Who needs this anyway? Who needs all the hustle and the bustle? And who needs all the, we're spending money we don't have. And yeah, I'm giving you a gift and you're giving me one, but it lacks sincerity. Bah, humbug, right? Who needs it? Well, God decided the world did. He knew that none of us could ever save ourselves. He knew that you needed it and I needed it. And he knew that we were hopelessly lost. No matter how hard, no matter how much effort we made to connect with him, none of us could be good enough to do that. Not with better technology, not with better politics, uh, not through better human relations, not through diplomacy, not through better education. There was nothing we could do to give us what we most needed. The Apostle Paul again said it this way in Romans 5, verse 6. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. This miraculous fulfillment of this incredible, irrational promise made thousands of years earlier happened not because we deserved it. It didn't happen because a group of people came to their senses and pulled themselves up by their sandal straps and got with the program. Paul was right. We were helpless and hopeless. We were powerless. We would have been no different, I'm convinced, than the Jews who were there on the day Jesus was born. We needed a Savior, just like they did. We need a Redeemer, just like they did. And so God kicked in an incredible Christmas story 2,000 years ahead of time. I think it's an amazing and for me, even a sentimental story. A Savior leaves the perfection of heaven and he comes to a messy, messed up world. A 2,000 year old promise is fulfilled in incredible detail and accuracy. And of the many things that this should say to us today, to me, it sings out 
that even when things look impossible, even when you feel totally hopeless, no reason for hope, even in those dark and bleakest of moments, God is at work in ways we'll never see. And it may take us a while to ever know of. He never sleeps. He never looks the other way. His promise is he will never leave us. He'll never forsake us. God is always at work. Now, he's not on our timetable, and he's not a lap dog. He doesn't do what we tell him to do. He's no genie in a bottle. But he's never not at work. And he, I think this is the bottom line of Christmas. God keeps his 2,000-year-old promises he kept. When Jesus explained to Nicodemus why he had come to earth, which really is the motive for Christmas, he did it with one sentence. And I'll bet you you know this one sentence from memory, many of you. We're going to read it together out loud. It will be on the screen, John 3.16. Would you join me? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and all, Whoa, 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 whoa. Let's say it and not mumble it. Okay, here we go. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And we memorize it from three or four different versions and so the words kind of get mixed up in our mind. But here you go. That's the point of Christmas. When God thought of the world... He wasn't thinking in terms of nations. When he thought of the world, he wasn't thinking in terms of people groups. When he thought of the world, he wasn't thinking in plural. He was thinking in the singular. He was thinking of you and me. You know that old saying, if you were the only person who needed a Savior, God still would have sent Jesus to die to save you from your sins. It's true. It's true. And that's the heart of the Christmas story. It's hard to remember in the busyness of the months leading up to December the 25th. And some of us have many reasons why it's hard, more reasons than others. This may be the first reason, the first Christmas season you'll be celebrating without a loved one because of their death. And for some other reason, they're absent. Could be that Christmas doesn't bring up for you memories of joy and happiness, but it brings up memories that you never want to remember if you can keep from it. I just want to call us back to the heart of Christmas. That God loved you so much sent his one and only son in the most extraordinary and miraculous of ways. Father in heaven, I, I am amazed each time I look into the Christmas story on so many levels that you would son, send your son Jesus to as a sacrifice I'm so inadequate. I make so many mistakes. I'm, I'm so messed up, and yet you thought of me. Please, God, don't let me drift from that through this Christmas season. Make it the center, kind of the center of gravity for my life and all our lives. We're going to continue celebrating Advent, and Jeff and Nancy Yoder are going to guide us in that. The third Sunday of Advent symbolizes joy with the shepherd's candle, reminding us of the joy the world experienced at the coming birth of Jesus. Do you ever think about what it must have been like for those shepherds sitting out in the field, watching their sheep, minding their own business? When suddenly an angel appeared, 
In Luke 2, 9, it says the shepherds were terrified. I bet they were. It's not every day we have angels appearing to us all in God's glory. Knowing this state of fear, the angel says, do not be afraid. I bring you great news of great joy that will be for all the people. Well, just because you tell me not to be afraid doesn't mean I still won't be afraid. I'd be shaking in my boots. Even though they were afraid, the shepherds kept listening to what the angel had to say. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. I think at this point my fear might turn to awe, reverence, and even wonder at what I was seeing and hearing. And if it wasn't enough, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel. The angels praised God, saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. The angels were worshiping the Christ, so the shepherds felt compelled to go in person and worship the Savior. They were in wonder and awe. Those they told were in wonder and awe. Mary was in wonder and awe, keeping these things and pondering them in her heart. Like the angels and shepherds, we have the opportunity this Christmas to celebrate the birth of Christ with our festivities and to glorify him by singing praises to him. And also like the shepherds, we have the great privilege of telling others the amazing reason for this season of happy celebration. Let's pray. Lord, help us recapture some of the holy fear, reverence, and awe of the birth of God's Son this Christmas season. And help us to make the most of this opportunity that we have right now to share this good news with our family, friends, and neighbors. Amen. Thank you. Um, one of the things that uh, Jeff had spoken about uh, and prayed about is that this is a season for us to be able to, like shepherds, proclaim the good news. I'm, I want to challenge you that in these days between now and Christmas, you look for opportunities to be like a shepherd and to tell the story, the, the good news, the hope of the coming of Jesus. One of the ways you can do that, and uh, I don't want to offend anybody, but uh, I'd love for us to all say Merry Christmas. You know, it, uh, I, you already know, I don't care much for political correctness. I don't want to hurt people's feelings unnecessarily, but Merry Christmas? Come on. So, anyway, that's one thing you can do, is uh, wish people a Merry Christmas. Here's a second thing you can do. On Christmas Eve, our normal morning services on the 24th are going to be really good services. I, I want you to invite people to join you. And our, our service in the evening of Christmas Eve is going to be just absolutely wonderful. And it'll be such a great service for you to bring a friend or a co-worker or a family member to. Uh, and part of the reason is it's only 45 minutes long. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I want to challenge you to use this season as a moment of outreach. You know, there are people that uh, this is one of the only times of the year that the gate slides open for them to think about Jesus. And let's seize upon that. Let's make the most of it. Would you stand with me? And uh, as you are getting ready to leave, just turn to somebody and say, I'm going to be like a shepherd. Are you?